Welcome, and thank you all for joining today's fascinating webinar on yoga, past and present. I am Dr. Bharti Kansara, Vice President of American Friends of SOAS, which offers a brilliant MA in yoga and meditation, as well as a PhD program in yoga studies. And we have just started a SOAS yoga studies online. Although millions in the US and Europe practice some form of yoga today, in 2018, it was one out of seven in the United States. Most are unaware of its underlying history and metaphysics. So today's webinar will explore the deep philosophical roots of yoga in ancient times, its metamorphosis in the medieval period, and what it has morphed into today in the United States and in Europe. In today's world, yoga has become a way of promoting physical and mental health. Gyms run yoga classes, hospitals prescribe it for patients and pregnant women, psychotherapists encourage it, Today, yoga is ubiquitous and yet barely understood in its real nature as a profound spiritual practice begun in ancient India. Professor Andrew Nicholson will explore for us yoga's roots in the Indus Valley civilization and in Vedic times. He is an associate professor at Stony Brook University, State University of New York, and author of many books, including the award-winning Unifying Hinduism, Philosophy and Identity in Indian Intellectual History, and also Lord Shiva's song, the Ishvara Gita. He is currently working on The King and the Yogi, Visions of Ethical uh, Perfection in South Asian Thought. Dr. James Mallinson, head of SOAS's Center of Yoga Studies, will reveal the contribution of the Nath and other Sampradayas or yoga lineages in medieval times, their contribution to the development of Hatha or physical yoga. He has written nine books relating to Sanskrit texts on yoga, poetry, and epic tales. Amanda Lucia, professor of religious studies at University of California, Riverside, will delineate for us what yoga has morphed into in present day United States and European societies. She has written an excellent book on this called White Utopias, The Religious Exoticism of Transformational Festivals, published in 2020. In addition, she has explored the phenomenon of celebrity gurus, especially Amma, the Hugging Saint. Our moderator, Seth Powell, is completing a doctorate in yoga studies at Harvard University with a dissertation on the 15th century Sanskrit yoga text, Shiva Yoga Pradipika. He has created a leading online educational platform for yoga and South Asian studies. Our three experts will give a 10 minute presentation each followed by a 15 minute panel discussion, moderated by Seth Powell, followed by a 10 minute audience Q&A. So please put any questions you have for our distinguished panelists into the Q&A box. And we will end with my vote of thanks. So without further ado, please welcome our first um, speaker, uh, and presenter, Professor Andrew Nicholson. Thank you very much, Andrew. Take the stage. Thank you, Bharati. And it's a pleasure to be here to see so many people interested in the history of yoga. Um, so I've been given a fairly unenviable task in covering 2,500 years of yoga history in 10 minutes. For obvious reasons, that is 
impossible. But what I'm going to do instead is provide just a few snapshots of the early history of yoga and hopefully try to resolve some questions about yoga and who the yogis in the beginning were. So let me do a little share screen here. Um, so I'm taking as my theme today, is yoga Hindu? This um, is revisiting an article I wrote back in 2013 that was um, in part a response to an organization in the United States that made the claim that yoga is authentically Hindu and that therefore they needed to take back yoga and restore it and restore the appreciation for its Hindu roots. So um, in part because of that, I chose to uh, examine, you know, what does it mean for yoga to be Hindu and what does the historical evidence say? I think interestingly enough, in 2015, some five years after the Take Back Yoga uh, campaign, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi came out and said that, in fact, yoga is not Hindu. Yoga is Indian, broadly speaking. So in 2015, he gave a talk at the UN and he said that, quote, yoga is an invaluable gift of ancient Indian tradition, unquote. And some of his ministers in the BJP party clarified that, yes, in fact, yoga is a practice for everyone. You can be Sikh, you can be Muslim, you can be Christian and still practice and benefit from yoga because it is Indian, but not specifically Hindu. So that's an interesting move he made in 2015. I think it upset a lot of people on the Hindu right, actually. I mean, perhaps we can talk in the question and answer of why he made that uh, choice to frame it that way. So um, from my perspective as a historian, first of all, many people talk about the Indus Valley civilization and uh, excuse me for showing you this again, but this is the famous slide from uh, this famous seal seal 420, sometimes known as the Proto Shiva or Pashupati seal. And the first thing I thought I would do is to reflect briefly on this seal and what exactly it is. So uh, in 1931, an archaeologist named John Marshall said that this is Proto Shiva, and he's sitting in some kind of yogic position. And furthermore, this is Shiva in his form as the Pashupati, the lord of beasts and we know that because he's surrounded by animals and the seal um i would say that although in the mid 20th century authors like machia iliada in his famous book yoga immortality and freedom accepted that understanding in the 21st century a minority of scholars of the history of india still accept that idea and there are a few reasons um i would say one of them is, okay, we have this Shiva seal and an image of Shiva, and then somehow the portrayal of Shiva in Indian art vanishes for about 2,000 years until the next um, unmistakably uh, Shaivite depiction is in the first century BCE during the Shunga dynasty in uh, in. Uh, Andhra Pradesh. So the question is, well, where did Shiva go for this 2000 year period if, in fact, he was already being worshipped and images such as this one were being made to Shiva at this time? Another question, I'm not sure if this um, Marshall addresses this, but the word Pashu, as it's understood in texts like the Atarva Veda, does not mean a wild animal. Um, typically, Pashu refers to domestic animals, animals like horses or goats or sheep. And certainly when we talk about Pashupati and Shiva as the Lord of beasts, almost exclusively those beasts are the type of beasts one has as domestic animals. Um, and if you look on this slide, you can see that there are four animals from left to right. They appear to be a water buffalo, a rhinoceros, an elephant, and a tiger. So. By my estimation, only one of those animals, the water buffalo, is a pashu in the sense it's usually understood in, uh, in Vedic texts. So that's another reason I would be skeptical of the claim that this is Shiva. Um, uh, recently, a scholar named Asko Parpola wrote a book uh, called The Roots of Hinduism. 
And there he talks about this proto Shiva or Pashupati seal, connecting it to Mesopotamian culture and specifically proto Elamite art. This is a, a culture that existed between 3100 and 2900 BCE, just east of the Tigris River. And he said the so called yoga posture, the Harappan deity dubbed proto Shiva, seems to derive from the way in which seated bulls are represented and proto-Elamite art. And I think one of Parpolo's enormous contributions to understanding the Indus Valley civilization is noting this connection between Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley civilization. And in fact, there was very likely trade and cultural exchange between uh, Mesopotamia and Indus Valley civilization. Another thing he says is particularly uh, stimulating. He says on the Prior page, page 209 of this book. While this does not prevent it from also being a prototype of a particular yogic asana, it somewhat weakens its power as evidence for the Harappan beginnings of yoga, unquote. So according to him, it's possible if we accept this as a yogi seated in perhaps Padmasana or Siddhasana, some seated pose like that, that the origins of asana go to Mesopotamia and not to the Indus Valley. I'm not sure that I buy that. I'm also not sure that we can definitively trace yogic asanas to the Indus Valley civilization. I think I'm guessing the other scholars on this panel would agree that probably taking an agnostic position on the question of whether yoga was practiced in the Indus Valley civilization is wise, given just how ambiguous the evidence is. Um, since my time is running out, let me move ahead a little bit to what I think is the clearest evidence of yoga no one no sensible person can doubt that the kata upanishad which is a vedic text dated off into the third century ce does give a definition of yoga that looks an awful lot like what we call yoga in later times so uh, chapter 6 verse 11 when the senses are firmly reined in that is yoga so people think from distractions a man is then free for yoga is the coming into being as well as the ceasing to be. This is Patrick Olavel's famous translation. Um, this definition of yoga as indriya dharana, the reigning in of the sense organs, should remind those of you who have read Patanjali, of course, dharana is one of the limbs of yoga. And this is unmistakably, I think, uh, a definition of yoga as we now understand it. But I would caution people about thinking that this means that yoga is exclusively Vedic because around the same time, we have Buddhists, for instance, in the Pali Canon, the Canon of Theravada Buddhism, talking about the Buddha during his enlightenment, sitting under the Bodhi tree and going through a sequence of four jhanas, is the word in Pali, or dhyanas in Sanskrit. And there too, this understanding of yoga as a kind of seated activity where one um, reigns in the senses using the mind. The metaphor from the Kata Upanishad, of course, is a charioteer who is the intellect, and he uses the reins skillfully, which are the mind, to rein in those horses. And the metaphor is the metaphor of yoga or yoking, because of course the word yoga is cognate with the English word to yoke or to join. So from my estimation, I think we can say with some certainty that sometime in the mid first millennium BCE, lots of different groups of people, not just Vedic people, but Buddhists, presumably Jains, other Shramana or spiritual strivers, were all developing these sorts of meditative or yogic techniques. Of course, most famously, we have Patanjali many centuries later, who uh, sometime around the fourth century, third century common era, um, systematizes and really synthesizes lots of different yoga traditions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think we should remember about Patanjali is he too is not exclusively quote unquote Hindu. So a lot of good work has been done recently exploring the Buddhist roots of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. This is not to say he's just Buddhist. I think he was borrowing from lots of different sources such as Samkhya philosophy such as the Vedas, of course, and texts like the Kata Upanishad, but also from Buddhist ideas. So for instance, 
unmistakably this idea of the four sublime attitudes or Brahma Viharas, which we find in Sutra uh, 133, Patanjali says, by adopting the attitude of friendship, Maitri, toward those who are happy, compassion toward those who are suffering, sympathetic joy toward those who are virtuous, and equanimity toward those who are w- wicked, clarity arises in the mind. So he's adopting a framework that we find in the Pali Canon, in the Tevijja Sutta, sometime perhaps around the first century BCE, we have the Buddha teaching a very similar thing. He says, with his heart filled with friendship, metta, that's the Pali word, maitri is a Sanskrit, he dwells suffusing one quarter, the second, the third, the fourth. Thus he dwells suffusing the whole world. And then he moves to compassion, karuna, sympathetic joy, mudita. So here, and equanimity is the fourth, upeka or upeksha. So here we have clear Buddhist borrowings from uh, early Buddhist meditative techniques in Patanjali. That doesn't mean Patanjali is a Buddhist, of course. It means he had a very interesting synthesis of many different earlier yoga traditions. And the last thing I want to end with is to caution that even though Patanjali today is remembered as being the fundamental or classical expression of Hindu yoga, that wasn't always agreed upon by later uh, Vedic thinkers. So for instance, we find Kumaralabhatta, a seventh century common era Mimamsa Vedic ritualist, very famous and influential scholar, who wrote, the treatises on righteousness, dharma, and unrighteousness, a dharma, that have been adopted in Samkhya, Yoga, Pancharatra, Pashupata, and Buddhist works are not accepted by those who know the Triple Veda, unquote. So there, at least in the understanding of Kumarila, as well as other uh, first century common era thinkers, such as Shankara, who also gives a caution about accepting Patanjali's yoga as authoritative, they do not understand Patanjali as being part of this Vedic tradition and instead want to associate it with these fringe groups such as Pashupatas, worshippers of Pashupati, interestingly enough, are not considered Vedic, and Buddhists. So here I think we can see just how contested some of these categories have been historically. And I'll just end with the observation that, you know, we've talked about Buddhist yoga, Hindu yoga, of course, Jains from a very early time practiced yoga, but so too when we get to the medieval period, we find uh, Muslim Sufi yogis adopting the Hatha yoga scheme of the chakras or power centers for their own type of Sufi meditation. And in the 20th century, we see Christian yoga, where Christians will do uh, yoga asanas and chant Bible uh, passages while they perform these things. So I don't think this uh, multiplicity of religious associations that we find in yoga in more recent times is actually that surprising. Yoga has been a kind of open source software, you might say, that has been widely adapted by many different groups over its history, and therefore is not just exclusively Hindu. Uh, I'll end there. I apologize for going over time, and I will uh, invite my colleague James Mallinson to uh, present on medieval yoga. Thank you very much for your time. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to Dr. Kansara as well for inviting me to, to speak to you all. Um, my, what I'm going to say compliments Andrew's excellent presentation very nicely. He's sort of pinpoint um, the origins of what we can really identify as, as yoga, you know, the first instances of something that really does look like what we would understand to be yoga around the time of the Kata Upanishad. And what I'm going to look at, I'm going to jump uh, at least a thousand years forward. I'm looking specifically at origins of what we might identify as uh, you know what what looks to us like modern yoga practice i.e uh, sort of complex physical postures and so forth so in the period that andrew was looking at we can be pretty confident we know for sure that uh, the uh, physical methods that were used as part of yoga uh, were um, essentially seated postures for meditation and then the only other thing, now hang on, got to get my slideshow going, where are we? Uh, 
keynote here we are. Oh, is that working? I'm seeing all kinds of things. Play. There we go. Okay, hopefully, hopefully everyone can see that okay. Um, and then, so around that period, so yeah, I'm going to look first of all at physical yoga methods before 1000 CE, because I see that as a sort of crucial uh, inflection point where things change quite dramatically. So in the period that uh, the, the of the Katu Upanishad that Andrew was talking about, uh, as I mentioned, yoga methods really are either seated postures for meditation, physical yoga methods, or uh, we see plenty of references to the performance of what's sort of collectively known as tapas. Now, this is obviously a 18th, I think it's a, a early 19th century, even illustration of a Ramayana manuscript from the British Library. But you see this complex of physical methods which effectively are for mortifying the body okay there's not this idea that we find in modern yoga traditions of cultivating the body of sort of improving it and using it thereby as a, a tool for uh, higher yogic levels states of mind it's more a, a case of subduing and uh, controlling and really almost sort of battering the body you know mortifying it as we see here in these various different practices hanging hanging upside down from a tree like a bat and in particular I'm going to look a bit more closely at this one holding the arms up in the air for years on end you see a couple of instances of that here now in the in our early text so here's a, a passage from the Mahabharata I won't translate the whole thing but it's describing a, a Brahmin uh, sage uh, ascetic called Mandavya you see here and among his epithets are Urdhvabahur Mahayogi okay so he's been called a great yogi uh, and in the same breath, he's been called Urdhvabahu, which is this idea of holding the arms up in the air for years on end, which still goes on to this day, incidentally. I'm not going to show you any pictures of that, but you can still find practitioners of that practice. So the two things, you know, yoga and these physical ascetic methods at this period are, uh, are very closely identified and still are, as I say, today among certain uh, traditions. And in our textual sources and also material sources for this period, so this is a uh, this depiction from the uh, stupa at Sanchi from the first century BCE, amongst one of our earliest uh, depictions of ascetic practice. You can see here what are perhaps Urdhvabahu ascetics, and we only see these kind of methods uh, up to about a thousand years ago. Okay, um, so here also from the very well-known relief at uh, Mahabalipura, Ma Mamalapuram, as it's known today. You can see here the the identity of this character is not certain, but again we see an ascetic uh, standing on one leg. You know he's emaciated. He's got his arms up in the air, and we get you know hundreds, thousands of, of stories of ascetics and yogis in the in the in the epics, Mahabharata, Ramayana, Puranas, and so forth, doing such practices. Similarly, Parvati. Uh, the uh, consort wife of Shiva. Well, before she, before she, she married him, uh, she wooed him by performing uh, these sort of austerities. So here's an eighth-century image of her with her arms in the air. Um, now all this changes about a thousand years ago. We get so we get no mention. What I'm going to look at specifically here. There's a whole complex of methods that arrive around a thousand years ago, which come to be called Hatha Yoga in Sanskrit texts. And here we see this new sort of dispensation of yoga practice with a, a positive attitude towards the body in which the body is cultivated rather than mortified and subdued, as we saw in those practices of tapas. Now, the innovations in these methods around a thousand years ago, they include uh, complex balancing postures. I think this is a sort of crucial distinction. It's not until this period that we see uh, postures that cannot be held indefinitely okay until then all these methods of tapas and so forth would be held for days weeks months years on end okay and suddenly we see the introduction of postures that you could only hold for a few minutes and I'll just give you a couple of examples in, in a minute it's only at this period also that we first find in our text these complex methods of, of pranayama of breathing so various different ways of uh, inhaling, holding the breath, exhaling, okay? Prior to that, we just get pretty simple uh, techniques of inhalation, holding the breath and exhalation. And then uh, thirdly, these groups of practices which come to be called mudras, 
Okay, but in the early sources, they're not all classified as mudras, but these various different physical techniques for manipulating uh, the vital energies in the body, whether that's understood as prana, the breath, or the jiva, the life force, or kundalini, or bindu, the sort of generative principle within the body. So there's all these um, different different techniques for manipulating those vital energies. And then finally, uh, cleansing techniques, this uh, Methods nowadays collectively often called the, the shut karmas, also referred to as kriyas, so methods for cleansing the body. Again, we don't find any mention of those until, in fact, these last, uh, the cleansing techniques, not until about 1400. So I am acutely aware of time. I shall just rattle through my remaining slides. But here, uh, here's, this is the first posture, the first what I call a non-seated yoga posture. So, and here it's a balancing posture that clearly can't be held indefinitely, the Mayodasana or the peacock pose. And that's first taught in a text called the Vimanachana Kalpa, uh, probably 10th century, maybe a little bit later, even could even be 11th or 12th century. Okay, and we then see the, the same practice, the peacock pose taught in a in a text which derive from, from this one. And then from a similar period, a little bit later, we also find the uh, kukutasana okay so another the, the cock the cockerel pose so another balancing posture that again cannot be held uh, indefinitely and that appears for the first time in the 12th century ahir buddhya sanghita now in probably the, the 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 sort of most influential text on physical yoga practice is called the the hatha pradipika and that was composed what's well, compiled really because it draws from lots of earlier texts including uh, these teachings on Kukadasana and Mayorasana. Uh, it was compiled in about 1400. And there we really see the first you know, explicit uh, explanation of what Hatha Yoga is and what its purposes are, what it brings about. And so we, hear, we see here very clearly in this, this verse, 278, Bapuhu Krishna Tvam Vadane Prasannata, Nadasvurta Tvam Nayane Sunirmale, Arogata Bindu Jayogni Deepanam, Nadi Vishuddhir Hatha Siddhi Lakshanam. So the signs of uh, success or perfection of Hatha are leanness of the body, which rings true today uh, to some extent. That's clearly why some people do physical yoga. Uh, 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 brightness of, of the face, uh, bright complexion, uh, the manifestation of internal sounds, very clear eyes, uh, freedom from disease. Uh, control of uh, bindu which is the sort of basically sort of uh, the sexual impulse uh, agni deepanam kindling of the internal digestive fire and cleansing of the channels so we get this very specific statement uh, which was you know unprecedented that these by performing these methods of yoga you effectively perfect uh, perfect the body um and i shall just wrap up a few more slides just to show that it's not just our textual sources that attest to this change prior to about a thousand years ago as you saw i showed you a few depictions of of the practice of uh, tapas these methods of you know standing on one leg holding the arms up in the air and so forth uh, we don't see any of these balancing postures in any material sources whether that's temple architecture or uh, you know illustrated manuscripts paintings and so forth until uh, this was a discovery I made in 2016 with a colleague, Daniela Bevilacqua, in here in Daboy in Gujarat. There's this uh, gate called the Mahudi Gate on the northern side of this small town. And up here, the, so the gate was created in 1230. And we were very surprised to see up here, no one had uh, recorded this before. I mean, people must have looked at them, but no one had paid much attention. Uh, a group of there's 84 carvings of yogis, about a dozen of whom were in these sort of balancing postures. So we see a headstand, uh, we see an inverted lotus posture. Uh, there's a few others. I'll just show you a couple more. Um, and yeah, these are the earliest known depictions of you know, non-seated complex yoga postures. So they're only from about 800 years ago. And then I just wrap up just uh, prior to this, the earliest known ones, uh, or more or less the earliest known ones were at Hampi or Vijayanagar in Karnataka uh, on the, the various, the, the many hundreds or even thousands of temple columns there. You see a few depictions of these complex uh, asana postures. So there's one. Uh, 
a rather interesting one using this funny little stick and that one yeah, there's some rather difficult ones in fact what these ones in particular also the ones at Dub Hoy, they do illustrate that um uh, you know they they show us postures which we don't find in text from these periods okay so good reminder to textual scholars like me that uh that, that not everything is is found in our text um so there's a couple more i'll show you i mean i could show you many many from from humpy but this is my last slide so hopefully that wasn't too long i think we're more or less going to time and uh thank you very much i'll now hand over to uh professor lucia thank you everyone hello Thank you everyone for being here and thank you to Dr. Kasara and to our um, tech Harris for being here and helping us manage ourselves. I'm going to um, skip ahead again. Um, hold on, just one second. It's been a while. I'm on sabbatical. <laughs> and so I forget how to use Zoom. I apologize. Okay, yoga and modernity, of course, is very complex and it's very diverse. Um, and it's likely something that many of our viewers here today have stakes in. So I'm going to try to briefly systematize this very diverse field and point, point to some existing scholarship, direct our attention to some questions that are currently shaping the field. Um, but of course, if I miss your favorite person, it's not intentional and largely just because there's so very much to cover. So if we were going to think about yoga in all of its different ramifications and diversifications today, we might come up with like a list of something like this. Um, of course, I've expanded a little bit beyond the postural to think about um, things like bhakti yoga or path of devotion. Karma yoga, Jnana yoga, um, and then maybe the first example of yoga branding in the modern, which would be Vivekananda's Raja yoga and his eponymous book in 1896, Kundalini yoga, Kriya yoga, Hatha yoga, as we've already heard a bit about, um, and then diversifying from Hatha yoga into kind of different people's versions of that, of Anusara, Ashtanga, Vinyasa, Iyengar, Vini yoga, and then the even farther example of kind of a wide diversification where we get things like hot yoga, power yoga, restorative yoga, yin yoga, aerial yoga, acro yoga, and then potentially even more controversially, goat yoga, booze yoga, weed yoga, heavy metal yoga, rage yoga, booty yoga, nude yoga, dog yoga, tantrum yoga, broga yoga, paddleboard yoga, and on and on. So how do we get from there to here? I'll try to do a little bit of work to help unpack that. This is a family tree of sorts that Yoga Journal published about 10 years ago. Um, and the credit there goes to Michael Hill for creating it. It's not uh, complete, but it's an interesting depiction of modern yoga and just how very diverse some of the different lineages are. You can see there Tibetan yoga and the Himalayan Institute, Haridas, Yogananda, um, but there's been some concern recently, and I think it's quite valid concern that we should not be necessarily thinking in arboreal structures, that if we think about yoga as having singular roots and origins that actually is um, counterproductive to how we should be imagining the world of modern yoga. So I would point to Deleuze and Guattari, who talked about rhizomatic structures, um, and those rhizomatic structures, which come from uh, mushrooms, in fact, challenges the assertions of root essences and purity or origination and counters the demands for the return to the those very aspects. So instead, if we think about rhizomes, I'm just going to try to kind of branch out into three different ways in which we can look at uh, what's happening in modern yoga. And I'll start with spiritual exports and then go to what we've been kind of focused so far as postural yoga and then nationalist yoga gurus. Now, these are not categorical divisions, more like what I would say is a useful Venn diagram um, and a kind of way to systematize our thinking. So first, spiritual exports, of course, metaphysical yogas began to travel outside of India, what I would call in the long 20th century. Many 
popular gurus, maybe even most modern gurus, popularized bhakti yoga or the path of devotion. Seva or selfless service became a vehicle through which to popularize karma yoga and jnana yoga or wisdom or logic teachings was also popularized, particularly in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, I mentioned Raja yoga already, but then Kundalini yoga was popularized by Yogi Bhajan and 3HO, um, but then also by Krishnamacharya with a different interpretation of the, uh, of the meaning of the snake. Kriya Yoga, of course, popularized by Paramahansa Yogananda. And if we think about these gurus who are popularizing, which is oftentimes a spiritual or metaphysical practice that only sometimes includes a postural component that goes along with it. Often this uh, lineage tends to be marked as a series of waves, um, with the first wave being Vivekananda's speech at the 1893 World's Parliament of Religions in Chicago followed then by Paramahansa Yogananda in the 1920s, but then other key figures as well, like Meher Baba and Judu Krishnamurti. Uh, Philip de Sleep's notable work on Punjabi Sikh yogis traveling and tutoring in various yogas in the 1920s through the 1960s is a very important intervention so that we don't overlook some of the smaller figures who um, don't tend to make it into the kind of wave narrative. Um, and we're incorporating what he calls a, quote, dizzying array of philosophies, practices, and techniques into what they were producing. <clears throat> the second wave most people are the most famous with, or the most familiar with, rather, the famous yogis of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who founded TM, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, uh, founder of ISKCON, Muktananda, Siddha Yoga, Chinmayananda, who famously opened up Woodstock, um, uh, or sorry, Chinmayananda, who was uh, uh, the founder of Chinmay Mission, excuse me, and Swami Satchitananda, who opened up Woodstock. Bhagwan Rajneesh, a bit notorious, um, but very influential, and then Ram Das with his famous Be Here Now. The third wave uh, is, in some sense, coming on the wake of a lot of scandals that happened in the second wave, and it introduced a lot of female figures like Mata Amritanandamai, Mother Mira, Karunamai Ma, um, and then Guru Mai. But then I also put Swami Nityananda in this category because he's established himself as um, uh, persecuted by, by the kind of Hindu mainstream, which we can talk about in the Q&A if we want. There's a lot of books, of course, on guru-based uh, spiritualized or soteriological yoga. And these are just a few of the kind of highlights of books that have come out in the last, uh, uh, in this field. Okay. Moving then forward into postural yoga or physical yoga, and that's um, what we've mentioned mostly so far, the famous and the most famous figures that are articulated um, of the 20th century would be Patavi Joyce, founder of Ashtanga Yoga, Krishnamacharya, and his son TK's Des Desikachar, and then Ayengar. In the 1920s, there's this linking between yoga and science where Sri Yogendra, Yogendra founds the Yoga Institute and Swami Kuvalayananda publishes Yogi Mamamsa, both of which aim to prove the scientific efficacy of yoga. That will return as a theme again and again. In the 50s, Theos Bernard publishes Hatha Yoga, Indra Devi opens her yoga studio in Hollywood, Richard Hittleman pioneers yoga on television, uh, and the Baptists found their San Francisco yoga studio. Swami Vishnu Devananda founds the network of Shivananda Yoga Vedanta Centers. By 1966, Iyengar has published his Light on Yoga and travels to the USA, and Amrit Desai founds the Yoga Society of Pennsylvania and later the Kripalu Yoga Ashram, which has since dissociated from his uh, personage. Again, Swami Rama undergoes scientific testing to pr prove yoga efficacy. And then it's not until 75, 1975, that Patabi Joyce travels to the USA, bringing Ashtanga Vinyasa, which is now a very popular form of yoga postural practice. Um, TKS Desi Kachar also brings Vini Yoga to the West. And in that same year, Yoga Journal publishes its first issue. From there, we would have an extraordinary expansion of what we would view as postural yoga teachers. I just pulled maybe the top 100 of people whom I could think about, and oftentimes there's these one, top 100 lists that are published. Interestingly, of these, many of them have their own um, brands and their own organizations that accompany their name. 
So it's not just a list of individuals, but also organizations and uh, personalities, Instagram uh, strategies, etc. A whole host of separate scholarship that focus on hatha yoga or postural practice, um, and also this link with science you can see recurring again. The last theme that I want to talk about is nationalist yoga gurus, and um, uh, Dr. Nicholson discussed uh, Modi as is calling yoga as kind of an Indian national export or a uh, treasure. This is a very conflated issue as well with Hindu nationalism, but not always, as he's made clear. Um, Swami Chinmayananda, of course, becomes the first founder and president of the BHP. And there's also a series of uh, yogis or gurus who become advisors to prime ministers and head political officials. Uh, L.K. Advani, of course, is an interesting mix of a religio-political figure. Sadhvi Ritambara, who's made most famous by her hate speech at the demolition of the Babri Masjid in 1992. Um, on, a, on a more positive note, Baba Nagnath Yodeshwara fasted for Ganga pollution or fasted in, uh, uh, against the continuing pollution of the Ganga in 2008. Uma Bharati, also CM of Madhya Pradesh, was put in charge of Ganga Rejuvenation Project. Um, and then Yoga Day International was this International Yoga Day was established in 2014, with which many of you will be familiar. Today, there are many different yoga gurus who are operating in India who are very closely linked to governmental politics. And here we might just think of Baba Ramdev or Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, uh, even Yoga Adityanath, Yogi Adityanath, uh, the CM of UP, Sakshi Maharaj, uh, Computer Baba or Namdeo Das Tyagi, Shivaraj Chodan, and on. Here too, there's a whole separate literature of uh, books that are focused on this, what we might call guru governmentality or the intersections of religion and politics or the integration of uh, yogic science with um, uh, nationalist ideologies. So if I were to think in terms of just a few questions that we might offer or what kind of questions are shaping the field, it would be um, thinking first about transnationalism. So how has yoga expanded transnationally and what are the impacts of that expansion? Religion. What are the ramifications of yoga being interpreted as, interpreted as either religious or spiritual or secular? Neoliberalism, how has yoga become an expression of neoliberalism? Can it be a site of resistance? And this is an interesting interrogation that really comes into question with regard to yoga as it becomes practiced and or mandated in prisons or corporations and schools. Several great books um, that have just come out on this. Uh, and then questions of power. So questions regarding whiteness. So as yoga had become popularized around the world, how has the practice become so dominated by whites located in the West? Is it accurate to say that yoga has South Asian origins? And if so, has South Asia, quote, lost control of the brand? Nationalism, how does yoga fuel Hindu nationalism or Indian nationalism? And how is that expressed through yoga? Um, and then lastly, abuse, how will modern yoga, both practitioners and scholars confront recurring allegations of abuse in yogic environments? Um, and that also relates not only to the teacher student practitioner relationship, um, but also the ways in which capitalism has uh, impacted yoga teachers and um, their role in, in late capitalism. And I'll end there, thanks very much. Okay, I think I'll ask all of our panelists to put their videos on and thank you to all of our esteemed panelists for these wonderful uh, presentations. We've uh, remarkably covered a few thousand years of yoga's history in about 30 to 40 minutes. <laughs> no easy feat at all. So if your head is spinning from that, um, I, I think that's only natural. So we have about 15 minutes, uh, it looks like, for q and I see some questions have already come in. Um, if you'd like to pose a question, please use that Q&A box. It should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen there. And we can direct those individually to panelists uh, or to, to the entire panel to stimulate some conversation. So I'll just go 
you know, through these, uh, we, you know, we might not be able to get to all the questions that come in, but we'll, we'll certainly do our best. So uh, the first ones are going back to um, Andrew's presentation. Uh, maybe an easy one to get us started. Um, what is the triple Veda? But then I'll add to that um, another question. So that was from Barbel. What is the triple Veda, Andrew? And then a second related question is thinking about the Vedas from Dharminder. Is there nothing in the Vedas that yoga can be traced to? And if so, are there any parallels in the Avesta? So we talked about the Indus Valley and then kind of jumped to the Kata Upanishad. So maybe saying something about what we can or cannot say about yoga in the Vedas. But first, the, the triple Veda. Okay, so the triple Veda, oftentimes the triple knowledge, Trayi Vidya, refers to the Rig, Yajur, and Sama Vedas, typically. Those are the first three Vedas chronologically to be created. The Atarva is sometimes left out as a kind of fourth Veda. Sometimes it's included, sometimes not. But my understanding is usually when they're referring to triple Veda, they're referring to the Rig, Yajur, and Sama. Uh, the question of uh, whether there's anything about yoga in the Veda, well, First of all, just to define some terms, the Upanishads, of course, are part of the Veda. In fact, they are the end of the Veda, the Vedanta, literally, the Vedanta. So yes, the, the text that I mentioned, the Gatta, is undoubtedly part of the Veda, but perhaps the, the question was more referring to these earlier parts of the Vedas, known as the Veda Samhitas, and is there any uh, evidence of yoga there? And I would say the reason I skipped so far is there are tantalizing glimpses of yoga-like activities in these earlier parts of the Veda, um, but nothing clear and definitive for a skeptically minded person. Certainly nothing like what we find in the Kata where they're just like, this is yoga, it's raining in the senses. That is, you know, a beautiful and, you know, comprehensive definition for, you know, for these meditative practices of yoga. I would say to get us started I mean, there's a lot we could say about this there's some really interesting sort of proto-yogi figures one i'll mention is this figure known as the Keshin in the rig veda so in rig veda 10 136 this long-haired one this Keshin is described as wearing red or yellow clothes this may remind you of renouncers in later times because he has long hair you know maybe that's something like later shaivas having long matted hair He's described as riding on the wind and having some kinds of supernatural powers. Perhaps that's something like what we see, for instance, in the third chapter of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra that describes these extraordinary powers one can attain, these siddhis one attains through yoga. But again, they're sort of tantalizing and ambiguous glimpses like this Keshin that require a lot of um, interpretation. So if we want to project back we might say, oh, yeah, that Keshin, he's a, a yogi. But again, I would caution that, you know, there's this kind of presentism, this tendency to project our present understanding back onto a Vedic seal, like the so-called Pashupati seal, seal number 420, or to project later Shaiva yoga traditions onto the Keshin and the Rig Veda. It's a natural inclination, of course, but it's something that we should also be aware of our own biases when we're doing that. So yes, there's lots of tantalizing things that look a little bit like yoga, but the really clear stuff, I would say, comes in these post-Buddhist Upanishads like the Kato Upanishad. Thank you, Andrew. All right, the next question is from Vishal. Um, he says, I think what is more interesting is not from which religious or spiritual group yoga emanated from, but why yoga was being practiced. Would the panelists agree? Uh, so this could be for Andrew or for, for anyone, um, but do we have any sense, you know, we talk a lot about origins and is yoga Hindu, is yoga Buddhist, does it belong to one particular tradition or not? But this question is sort of getting us to think about why did yoga emerge in the first place? 
Um, do you want me to say something about that? I can, I can, I can jump in here. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree. I mean, like, if, if the easy answer to the to Vishal's question is yes. I think you're absolutely right, and I think it's almost impossible. So, with the texts that I primarily look at, those Hatha Yoga physical texts, we can be confident that the first one actually was written by Buddhists in the 11th century. But I don't think that necessarily means that they were the first people to to do physical yoga practice. Um, they were just the first to write it down. And we see lots of other uh, traditions, you know, various different subdivisions of Hinduism and so forth, also producing texts in a similar period. But yes, I would totally agree with you that the the more interesting question, really, and the much more difficult question is why was it being performed? I think if we go back to the period Andrew looks at, many scholars would agree that the really sort of possible period was about the fifth century uh, BCE, when we have these these groups of ascetics called shramanas, and there seem to be these new ideas of karma and uh, reincarnation, and then the corollary, which is liberation and getting off the cycle of rebirth, and these new techniques appeared as methods of, of dealing with that problem, not just yoga, well, not just the physical methods, you know, all kinds of different practices were undertaken. And then similarly, in the period that I I, I focus at, and this is a, a question that really exercises me, and I know I don't have a a, a solid answer to it why do these practices appear why do people start doing these physical methods about a thousand years ago we do see parallels in china fun enough in fact slightly in some slightly earlier chinese texts we see some of the physical techniques that appear in india uh, uh, a couple of hundred years later we see them first of all but why that should be the case, why there should be this turn to the body, I don't know. And this is a, a question that exercised me, as I say, and I, I find very interesting. So if anyone's got a, a better answer than mine, I'm all ears. I, yeah, I agree. I, that, oh, sorry. No, no, the, you go ahead, Andrew. This question of origins, I think, completely overblown. This sort of mania for origins is really a holdover in some ways of very traditional sorts of orientalist scholarship and assumptions that whatever is the earliest is therefore the most authentic and the best. But again, if we think of yoga instead of a kind of pure primordial tradition, think of it more like, uh, I don't know, software or your iPhone. Am I really going to claim my the iPhone 1 back in 2006 is superior on the iPhone 14? So perhaps the kinds of yoga that Jim is talking about are even, who knows, hot yoga or doga or Broga? Was there a broga in there? Perhaps that is a, a improvement on or, or, you know, at least more relevant development than these very early forms of yoga, which I think, for instance, looking at early Buddhist history, I think the odds are that the types of meditations actually performed around the time of the Buddha were very simple and they become more interesting the later we go on in history. And so, yeah, why, who cares about origins ultimately? I, I was sort of tasked with being the origins guy for this, for this uh, webinar, but I agree that in some ways it's not a very interesting question, like these questions of identity, who owns yoga, what the oldest yoga is. I'm more interested in what yoga does and what it does for people and how, how they interact with it. And just to repeat something Jim said that, I mean, the glib or obvious answer to why do yoga is this word moksha or nirvana, which again was an innovation probably in the second half of the first millennium BCE, this new idea that there's a cycle of death and rebirth. You have to escape this. Well, how? Well, yoga seems along with uh, esoteric wisdom as a very good candidate for a method to escape this, this vicious cycle, this cycle of suffering. But more interestingly, perhaps there are all sorts of other reasons one might do yoga. Jim hinted at uh, being slim and attractive. Also, I, I've always been intrigued in tantric circles and hatha yoga circles by this idea that it's not just mukti, liberation, it's also bhukti. There's sort of extraordinary pleasures that one can attain through yoga as well. So it's not exclusively liberation, moksha or mukti. There are other things you get from yoga too. And I think clearly in modern yoga, maybe Amanda can talk about, you know, is moksha the main reason people do modern yoga? I think there are a lot of other motives why someone might do yoga. All right. Well, our next question is for Amanda. This is from Nico. What is the role of Yoga Alliance and its YTT in producing, quote, teachers of yoga who then go out and teach and compete and participate in generating a lot of confusion about practices and philosophy? So 
maybe if you have some thoughts on the role of yoga alliance, yoga teacher trainings, and the production of the yoga teacher in today's yoga climate. You've picked a very difficult, there's a lot of difficult questions for me in the chat. I'm reading them very quickly and trying to answer them, but um, certainly that is one of them. I think that, you know, we have to remember Yoga Alliance uh, was only founded in 1997, so it's quite recent if we're talking about a few thousand years of history today. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think that Yoga Alliance is, okay, let me think about more broadly about some of the positive things that are happening in terms of trying to educate yoga teachers, which is um, a lot of these master's programs that are popping up. So us being one of them, uh, Loyola Marymount in California being another one with Chris Chapel at the head. There's also a lot of people who are very educated in the practitioner scholar role. I think that the field of yoga studies is quite blurry, in fact, as far as scholars and practitioners. Now, as far as the kind of factory training that we might say of 200 hours and the push to encourage people to become teachers in order to um, make money for yoga studios who offer those programs, I think there's really frightening things happening there. Um, but it also depends on how you think about um, uh, uh, what is the requirement for one to have a, a baseline knowledge of yoga? So in my fields, I was in in the in in the field of yoga classes, hearing kind of a lot of things that I thought, okay, that's just not true, or that's just not real but then I had to really question for myself what am I thinking is true and real and where am I asserting that you know Andrew's comment about how oh maybe broga yoga is an improvement on uh on the past we can't really it's hard if you don't want to make a value judgment about what people are doing you kind of end up in one camp or another either saying that yes there's a standard that we're trying to uphold and these people are not meeting it and it's actually corrupting uh influence or we want to allow kind of a marketplace freedom of ideas and that checks and balances on true and real are not um, productive. So I think there's a lot of other scholars who have written about, in fact, the ways in which the yoga teacher training can be a, a, a money-making enterprise. And that's an important thread to keep in that conversation is just how much um, it is a capitalist engagement. Yes, there's a lot more that, that could be said about that. Certainly, and I'm sure as many, you know, in attendance know that these teacher trainings are very much tied to the livelihood of yoga studios and to keeping those centers open, they have to run these trainings. And so that inevitably leads to a surplus of more teachers. Uh, but I think we also know a lot of those teachers don't, you know, go on to continue to teach. They might see that as just a, you know, an immersion into their practice in a more formal way. Um, but certainly the onus is on any teacher to continue to educate themselves, you know, as best that they can. Okay, uh, we have, I think, maybe a few more minutes. We're at about the hour mark here. There's definitely a lot more questions here in the box. So thanks, everybody, for sending these in. And again, just apologies, we won't be able to get to all of these. Um, let's see, I think these next few are sort of related. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, after all that we've heard, isn't it reasonable to question any lineage claiming or a tradition affirming something really solid or consistent? Uh, so this one is about lineage and traditions claiming. I, th I think the idea here is about um, a sort of essentialist view of their history, um, but then somewhat related to this Stefan asks, what are yogic arguments on mixing various traditions for one's own practice versus sticking to a particular lineage or a single tradition? So I guess to put this out to everyone, whoever wants to answer, um, thoughts on whether we should have skepticism about people making claims about their own lineage's history, and then thoughts about what do, what do the traditions, maybe the texts, say about um mixing matching or sticking with one particular tradition um should i i'll jump in i'll i'll, I'll address the second one because i think i've got something pertinent to say there about sticking to one tradition i mean within texts and so forth 
uh, of course, the, the dominant um, teaching is that you have to learn everything from a guru, normally your, your particular guru. But I've been struck by, so I've spent a lot of time with ascetic traditions in India. And in fact, there's, uh, you would never be advised to move outside of your sort of initiatory tradition, but they can be pretty big. You know, they can be thousands and thousands of, of, of sadhus, gurus and so forth. And I've been surprised that you're not expected just to copy your guru. You know, if your guru is an expert in even a particular practices of physical yoga, but you are more suited to, or you want to learn a, another method. So for example, I did a lot of field work on a practice called Ketri Mudra. If someone's guru doesn't practice it, there's no reason why you shouldn't then go and learn from uh, another uh, ascetic, another teacher within that within that tradition. In fact, there's a, a, a saying that the, the Samaj, the society of sadhus is the guru. So you're learning from everyone within that broader uh, tradition but yeah it would it's not generally seen as, as good form though to get it you know to go and learn from a, a teacher completely out of your particular the the individual sampradaya that you've been initiated into so i hope that sheds some hope that's useful in some way in, with that question i think there's a traditional metaphor one of my teachers in india i think it might be from the bhagavata purana that just as a bee goes from flower to flower picking the, out the rasa the the sap the juice from each so too a, a wise person will go from tradition to tradition taking that which is best from each of the traditions so although there is you know in some cases an emphasis on lineage there you are, are these kind of counter arguments you find in the tradition as well about eclecticism the, the, the value of being eclectic and i think as a historian, the more I see, the more I realize every yoga is a kind of hybrid yoga. I don't think, you know, I don't know what it would mean to have like a historically pure lineage. And that applies to religious traditions more broadly as well. I would just add the counter adage, which I've heard a lot of gurus say, like the big celebrity popular gurus of just, if you're trying to dig for water, don't dig a lot of shallow holes, right? Dig deeply once in a well to try to get the water. So I think it is a competing field where there's a lot of contested ideas. Um, but certainly um, any one guru, you know, it, it, it's not really, if they're saying you can't look elsewhere, then that might be a, a red flag, I would say, <laughs> for knowledge. Yeah, and of course, related to you know, hitching your wagon to to one guru, uh, we know that there's also all kinds of problems that can ensue from that. So another question, uh, and maybe I can direct this to Amanda, because I know this is something that you're working on quite a bit these days. Uh, in discussing the abuse of yoga, what about the texts that insist that one must completely believe in the guru no matter what, even if there is sexual or emotional abuse? Um, can you speak to practitioners being duped by abusers or gurus? This is obviously another huge topic uh, we, we, that we cannot do justice here in just a, a minute or two. Um, but if you want to say anything to that. Um, sure. I, I'll make a personal plug that we have a project that we're working on right now called Religion and Sexual Abuse. Um, and you can go to Religion and Sexual Abuse Project um dot com i believe or dot org and um it's a large group of scholars and there's also a conglomerate of scholars here in britain as well working on religion and sexual abuse that's including yogic uh environments in that so i would say in the in an indic yogic sense there's again competing texts there's texts like uh, um, well, I'm not, I won't name, but there are texts that say that one should obey the guru no matter what, that one should surrender the guru, that the guru is beyond reproach, that whatever the guru does is more than what humans could understand. So why would you, with your small human mind, try to critique the guru? Um, and then there's counter uh, texts that would argue that, or even traditions that in, in, in fact, it's the intention and the goal of the shishya to question the guru and to put the guru through a certain amount of trials before that one signs up to follow someone and that it's a testing and uh, relationship for both the guru and the shishya or for the, both the guru and the student before there's a kind of match made. Um, <clears throat> With that said, um, back to Yoga Alliance, they're they're working on measures to kind of address sexual abuse and emotional abuse in yogic environments. 
Um, and one of the things that I think becomes really problematic in religious communities is when there is no outside of, and we've seen this in a lot of different traditions, where there's no kind of HR rep that one can kind of uh, address claims to or problems to. And so one then if if one gets into be, into conflict with the leadership, one is forced to then leave and and leave without support. So sometimes uh, um, basic economic sustenance, family members who would be encouraged to kind of separate yourself from from the person who's leaving. So I think in in yogic and religious worlds more generally, abuse becomes uh, a highly uh, charged issue that 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 um, deserves more attention than it's getting in current scholarship. All right, so there's a lot more questions here, uh, but I know our, our time here is is limited and we do need to wrap up. Um, what do you guys think? Do you want to do one or two more? How are we feeling? Is there one? Is there a question here? I think can you guys that you guys can see? Is there one that you really want uh, to address? Uh, I can keep uh, kind of picking them out as I like. Uh, Jim, I was thinking maybe this question for you from Zahira about the original purpose of Hatha Yoga, because I think there's there's a lot of confusion about this. So she, Zahira is asking, is the original purpose of Hatha Yoga to prepare the body for the raising of Kundalini energy? And is this a part of Ashtanga Yoga? Oh, okay. A few things to unravel there. Um, the <laughs> earliest, I mean, I think all these all these these physical and tantric yoga methods tend to uh, have a, a a fundamental idea of something right going up the central channel some sort of vital physical energy it's not always called kundalini uh, and in the earliest texts which teach uh, well the earliest texts which teach the methods of hatha yoga there's no mention of kundalini whatsoever um, and there's this idea of the breath and perhaps bindu this kind of generative fluid in the body rising up are the practices just preparation for that? Well, not just, I mean, later, later texts would to say that you do these physical methods to strengthen the body in order to be able to do the higher, the higher practice, you know, the kind of dynamic asana, more like sort of, um, you know, physical uh, exercises to make your body stronger. But in the earliest uh, manifestations, it's the practices themselves that make the energy rise up the central channel. So they're not uh, preparatory as such and I think the last part of the question so I haven't got it in front of me was what's the relationship between these methods and Ashtanga yoga uh, so if that's the Ashtanga yoga you know most famously taught by Patanjali well as I, I I'm not sure I did say this earlier but in this early period of physical methods appearing lots and lots of different religious traditions put texts out there that teach physical yoga some of whom the kind of more orthodox hindu uh, schools do frame their teachings in uh in, in the ashtanga system of patanjali well with the, they don't necessarily reference patanjali but they use that eight uh, auxiliary framework and in fact funny enough i'm just coming to the end of uh teaching a course with seth's yogic studies platform of a, 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 a teaching from a text called the data Treya yoga shastra which i've been editing and that is the first text it's probably 12th century I think probably around 1200 and that incorporates Ashtanga yoga with um, physical methods of, of Hatha yoga but it's somewhat you know unusual in that early period because most of those early texts derive from uh, more tantric traditions in which the, the usual framework for uh, for a system systematic yoga is uh, it has six angas six six parts to it rather than eight All right, and then uh, let's do maybe one more question here that maybe could go to everyone. Um, again, from Vishal, thinking across all of our uh, topics today, is is there a dichotomy that you see between traditional and modern yoga? Or are the lines much more blurred and nuanced than this? And he kind of observes, sometimes the phrase modern postural yoga seems to be referenced in somewhat negative or pejorative terms. Um, but I think it, it depends on who's speaking, right? Uh, but how do you see these lines, if there are any, between modern and pre-modern or modern and so-called traditional yoga? Uh, 
Um, maybe Andrew, if you have any thoughts, and and then Amanda, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think oftentimes it's more like a rhetorical strategy. Like I'm doing the traditional yoga. I'm doing the classical yoga. Even, you know, Patabi Joyce's tradition associating itself with Ashtanga yoga, for instance. I would consider, you know, every one of these traditions to be a form of modern yoga. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think, you know, there are reasons people had certain motivations for doing certain things like uh, pretty exotic practices, putting a lead rod up your urethra or something in some of Jim's texts. There's a reason we don't do that anymore, right? We have a different understanding of physiology and what's important and what's valuable. So oftentimes those, you know, genuinely traditional practices, they're no longer done for a reason. It's because, you know, they don't appeal, they're not relevant to people anymore. So, you know, I think all of these traditions are modern traditions and that's just fine. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? Like I said, you know, I'd rather have an iPhone 14 than an iPhone 1. I'd rather do some of these updated yoga traditions that are informed with scientific understandings of human physiology and, you know, dangers one might have for some, if you have issues with sciatica or, you know, ruptured disc or something. These are things people didn't know about in medieval and classical times. And I'm glad that these yogas have been updated. And Amanda, do you want to say anything about how perhaps you approach this question in, in your work? Yeah, just that um, I feel like those are loaded terms, both, right, traditional and modern, and they're activated for political purposes by all of the actors in the field. Um, and so sometimes people will want to call themselves modern to show that they're innovative or that they're egalitarian or they're um, scientific um logical or ethical to produce some kind of like modern value system of liberty and such um but then there are others who want to refer to themselves as traditional that they are unearthing or recovering or putting forward the ancient tradition and so i think when we hear these words being kind of bantied or, or tossed about that we have to kind of investigate like what's underneath them and why are people using those as identity markers and claims Yeah, and I could just also point out that there's no there's no clear moment, you know, where the, where the pre-modern becomes the modern. You know, this is this is something that's debated in, in studies in modernity and cultural studies. So um, people have devised origins theories for for moments where this thing called modern yoga or modern postural yoga maybe was born. Um, but that's sort of just a, a, a convenience. Um, there's there's no there's no clean clean lines there separating these things. Um, so so thank you so much to, again to uh, our esteemed panelists, to to our hosts, uh, to SOAS for inviting all of us to be here to share with you all some of some of our work. Uh, to all of our attendees um, for these great questions and discussion. Uh, Barty, do you want to come on to, to help us close up here and say anything? Absolutely, yes. Um, I would love to close and thank you all for this very wide-ranging, uh, very um, fascinating discussion. And I was so interested to hear about the link with Mesopotamia. And so I think we can conclude that yoga is many things and has... Um, evolved in many ways in different cultures and societies. It is about the body beautiful. It's also about health and wellness. Be and it's also a spiritual practice because really we cannot separate the body, the mind and the spirit. These things are all one whole. And so all these elements will naturally come into it. So thank you so much for this amazing discussion. And I just to conclude, I will say that yoga is a universal gift to humanity. And to end on that note. And also, um, if you've enjoyed today's program and our terrific experts, um, we would be delighted if you could make a donation to SOAS. I think um, you can go to the um, SOAS website and make a donation. And there are many different 
um, causes to donate to. Um, and one of my favorite is the John Loyello Scholarship, whereby we bring an American um, student who otherwise would not have the financial resources to go to SOAS in London. So we collect monies to fund their tuition and their um, living expenses in London. So that's the John Loyello Scholarship. So please do donate to SOAS. And it's very exciting that um, Dr. Mallinson is starting um, an online program. So there's much to look forward to. And thank you again for all your fascinating and thought provoking discussions. So with that, we will end our uh, webinar today. Thank you to everyone and hope you enjoyed it. And you will find this on the uh, SOAS website as well. So you can revisit this discussion at your own leisure in your own way. Thank you all very much indeed. Bye everyone. <laughs>